Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm Kayla Hooven with Foley and Lardner. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's web conference titled FINRA's Examination Priorities and Enforcement Initiatives, Analysis and Prediction. Today's presenters are Allison Charney, Joe Edmondson, and Dean Jeske. Allison is a partner in Foley's New York office. Her practice concentrates on securities litigation and enforcement matters, government investigations, and white-collar litigation. She represents leading financial services firms, Fortune 500 companies, and accounting firms in litigation and investigations conducted by the DOJ, FBI, SEC, FINRA, FERC, PCAOB, New York State Attorney General, and other state and local agencies. Joe is a partner, securities litigation lawyer, commercial litigation lawyer, and professional responsibility lawyer in Foley's Washington, D.C. office. Joe focuses primarily on defending securities litigation and arbitration brought by the private clients and financial industry participants, as well as enforcement investigations and proceedings brought by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, state regulators, FINRA, and other self-regulatory organizations. Dean is a partner in Foley's Chicago office and focuses his practice on advising broker dealers and investment advisors. Prior to joining private practice, Dean was a deputy regional chief counsel in FINRA's Department of Enforcement. In that role, Dean supervised significant enforcement actions in FINRA's Midwest region and brought cases involving numerous high priority areas, including anti money laundering, complex products, municipal securities, and supervisory systems and controls. Before I turn the presentation over to our speakers, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour followed by a short question and answer session. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Please type your question into the Q&A widget open on the left-hand side of your screen. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows that you have open, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties during the presentation, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the presentation window, which is designated with a question mark icon. The PowerPoint presentation and recording will be available on our website at bully.com in the next few days, or you can get a copy of the slides in the resource list widget. The reference material will also be available for downloading in the resource list widget. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email to me, Kayla Hooven, at khuven at foley.com. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to log onto the ON24 session and answer polling questions during the program. As a final note, those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form in addition to the polling question that will appear during the program. A five-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Please email the form to Kayla Hoodman at Foley.com immediately following the program. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Dean. Thank you, Kayla. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, good afternoon for those of us, for those of you joining us uh, on the East Coast. Um, we're thrilled you could join us. Uh, we're excited about the presentation. And um, before I get started on the presentation, um, what I thought I would do is just give you a, a, a high-level overview of what we intend to cover on the presentation. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about FINRA's 2017 exam priorities letter. Um, that letter is available on FINRA's website. So rather than um, have Joe, Allison, and I just go point by point through the letter, um, we've tried to go through the letter a bit more carefully and um, compare it to prior year letters. And really what we want to do is highlight for you um, items that are new in this year's 2017 uh, letter, um, highlight items that um, might not jump out at you um, as you're reading through the letter, um, and highlight items that we think might give rise to um, the biggest risks 
as you're uh, preparing for your exam, if you're having an exam this, this year. Um, one of the other things we want to do is um, point out some, some subtle items that, uh, like I said, might not jump out at you as you're reading through the letter um, so that you can help prepare uh, for your exams. Um, just to give you an example uh, of what we're talking about, if you were to go back and look at the 2016 exam priorities letter, um, you would see that on page six of that letter in the middle, um, kind of buried between two much larger sections, um, there's a, a, a two or three sentence discussion about FINRA focusing um, its exam priorities on 529 plans. Um, I suspect that um, many folks um, who read the priorities letter last year saw that and probably didn't think too much of it. Um, and as many of you know, um, and several of my clients know, um, 529 plans were a big issue in 2016. In fact, um, I think it's fair to say that there's essentially a full-blown sweep of 529 plan-related issues going on um, that, that encompasses, at this point, as I understand it, 30 to 40 different firms. Um, so that was something uh, you know, that we're going to try and look for in this year's letter to see if we can maybe give you a heads up on, on those kind of issues. Um, and then while we're doing that, we're uh, also going to talk a little bit, to the extent it's relevant, about um, you know, what you might see in 2017 in, in terms of enforcement issues um, that, might, uh, that might be previewed a bit by this 2017 letter. Um, so typically the, the uh, exam priorities letter is divided into three primary sections. Um, I'm going to be covering the sales practice related uh, exam priorities. Um, and then I'll turn things over to Allison, um, who will discuss uh, exam priorities in the financial and operational areas. Um, and then towards the end, Joe will address the exam priorities focused on market integrity. And then as Kayla indicated, um, hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end to answer whatever questions you might have. Uh, so with that, let's, let's kind of jump in. Um, the first thing I wanted to touch on very briefly was just the, the cover letter that, that typically accompanies the exam priorities letter from the president and CEO. Um, and as you undoubtedly noted, for the first time in many years, uh, that letter is not from Rick Ketchum, um, who stepped down as the chairman and CEO at FINRA uh, in, in sort of mid-2016. So instead, the letter comes from... Um, Robert Cook, who's the new uh, president and CEO at FINRA. Um, and as I read through Mr. Cook's letter, um, I, I, I actually thought it was more noteworthy for what it didn't say as opposed to what it did say. Um, so typically in the letters from um, Rick Ketchum, um, he would highlight you know, one or two or oftentimes three kind of broad issues that, that he really thought were important to, uh, to reference to the members. Um, and Mr. Cook's letter didn't really do that. Um, I suppose that's probably not a big surprise given that he's only been on the job since August and so he's still in the midst of his listening tour. Um, but his letter did acknowledge uh, essentially as much um, and indicated that this year's priorities letter is, is really going to focus on core blocking and tackling um, issues. Um, and that blocking and tackling phrase, that's a, that's a phrase that's fully become a part of the, the FINRA lexicon um, and, you know, refers to kind of just the, the fundamentals and the basics of, of broker-dealer compliance and supervision. Um, so there's a lot of re repeat areas in this uh, exam letter or exam priorities letter, and, um, but, but again, with some different em emphasis. Um, there were two items that Mr. Cook referenced that I'll just touch on very briefly. Um, he indicated that on his listening tour, one of the things he heard about from firms was um, a, a desire to get more information on common exam findings. And so he's indicated in his cover letter that, that uh, FINRA is going to develop uh, some kind of summary report on exam findings. Um, there's no indication from Mr. Cook in his letter um, when that will be issued or how often it will be issued. Um, candidly, when I read that uh, part of Mr. Cook's letter, I, it, the first thought I had was that it, it essentially that sounds a little bit like what the exam priorities letter is um, anyway, but 
Um, on the theory that more information is always better than less, um, I guess we'll look forward to that. Um, the second thing that he mentioned in his cover letter was um, a, a desire by smaller firms to have some additional compliance tools and resources, and so he's committed in his letter to, to work with uh, FINRA staff to develop those kind of tools. Again, no indication of what those tools might be or, or when they're going to become available. But um, at a minimum, it, 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 it does suggest that Mr. Cook is listening and that he's trying to react to what he's hearing from the firms. All right, so let's dive into the actual priorities letter itself. Um, in prior years, there's typically an introductory section um, at the beginning of the, uh, the priorities letter before we get, we get into the, the, the three main sections um, that talks about and discusses broader issues that are of significance and that are priorities for FINRA in the, in the upcoming year. Um, if, for example, last year, firm culture um, was one of the issues that was right up front and center in the priorities letter and that caught a lot of people's attention. Um, this year, there, there really is only one issue that's, that's sort of pulled out and set apart from the, the, the primary three uh, categories, and that's the issue of high-risk brokers. Um, I can tell you um, from having been at FINRA very recently that this issue of high-risk brokers is it's probably the issue that keeps FINRA senior management awake at night more so than any other. Um, there's a, a pretty consistent fear at FINRA that um, some broker is going to go do something terrible, like convert customer funds or engage in a Ponzi scheme, and um, the Wall Street Journal is going to do a little digging and find out that that broker had a number of uh, regulatory disclosures on his, his or her U4 and, and write an article about it. Uh, and, and most often, that's not going to be an article that's positive for FINRA. So this really is a very high priority issue um, at FINRA. Now, um, hopefully, the, the folks that are on this phone don't have a lot of high-risk brokers at their firms. Um, but I do think there are a couple of, of important takeaways that you can glean from this section. Um, the first relates to the onboarding of brokers and the due diligence that uh, FINRA appears to be expecting. Um, I think it's pretty clear from reading the letter that um, FINRA is raising the bar a bit as to what they expect firms to do when they're onboarding new registered reps. Um, in fact, uh, one of the quotes I pulled out of the, the letter is um, an expectation that when firms are onboarding registered reps, they will, they or a third-party vendor will engage in a national search of reasonably available public records to verify accuracy and completeness of the applicant's U4. And so, you know, again, I think that that ups the bar a bit. Um, and I, I think you can all assume that if you onboard a rep and something goes wrong with that rep and FINRA starts looking at it, and the the young examiner who's working on on the matter from FINRA finds something on the internet that the firm could have found but didn't, um, you're going to be under a, a, a bit more regulatory scrutiny from FINRA in that matter. Um, so they're talking about, you know, doing searches for judgment liens, for tax liens, bankruptcy filings, uh, arrests and convictions. Um, and so you need to have your procedures account for that, um, and you need to be able to document that, that you've done those kind of those kind of searches when you're onboarding reps. Um, the, the second uh, takeaway, I think, from this section is the notion that if you do onboard a registered rep and that particular rep has some prior misconduct or some prior regulatory disclosures, there's going to be an expectation from FINRA that you have some kind of plan in place uh, to provide for special supervision or some type of heightened supervision for that uh, rep so that you can be sure that you'll detect and prevent any uh, future instances of, of that similar type of misconduct. Um, so those are the two sort of direct takeaways, I think, from this section. Um, the last point I just wanted to flag is, is one of those things that I think, if you were just reading through the, the letter, might not have jumped out at you, um, but it caught my attention. Um, in the last paragraph of this section on high-risk brokers, uh, FINRA indicates uh, 
a priority in evaluating firms' programs for branch office inspections. And in the course of describing that priority, uh, FINRA lists a series of items that they're going to look at when, um, when they're looking at firms' supervision and, and branch office uh, inspection programs. Um, things like unapproved email addresses, so the use of social media by, by reps out in the branch offices. Um, but one of the items that they listed in that, in that list of items um, that caught my attention was the use of consolidated statements. Uh, and the reason that caught my attention was um, that at about this time last year, as I was uh, beginning the process of leaving FINRA, this, this issue about consolidated statements was really starting to percolate. Um, and really what FINRA is talking about here is the relatively common practice of registered reps uh, doing a, an, an annual uh, summary for their clients or a, or a quarterly summary for their clients and preparing a report in connection with, with that meeting with the client um, and using various software to, cons to consolidate and aggregate both the assets that are held at the firm, but oftentimes assets that are held away from the firm. And the concern at FINRA is that those um, consolidated statements um, are not being adequately uh, supervised by the firms. Um, I can tell you that at the time I was leaving FINRA last spring, um, there were two very large firms that were being investigated uh, for that exact issue. Um, so I'm convinced to a virtual certainty that there will be at least one, if not more, enforcement cases in this area um, in 2017. Um, to the extent that you have registered representatives that, that are engaged in this practice, which I think everyone agrees is, is a good practice, um, you ought to pull out Federal Regulatory Notice 1019 and take a look at it. Um, it's got some very good ideas for, for or at least what FINRA thinks. Uh, should, you should be doing to supervise. Um, you know, I, one of the issues that I've, I've in, in this area that I've discovered as I've talked to firms about this um, since I've been back in private practice is uh, many firms don't really have a great handle on which of their reps are doing this, and of those reps that are doing it, what are they using to, to compile these, these um, you know, summary reports. Um, and in fact, you know, of the two firms that were um, under investigation by FINRA, um, what I learned was that, you know, at least one of those firms um, had as many as six or seven different software applications that different registered reps were using to compile these consolidated reports. And so I think one of the things um, that I would suggest to all of you if you think you have this issue is, is to really go out and, and, and pull your registered reps and see what, what they're using. And in a perfect world, you know, decide on one particular application. If you want to allow your reps to prepare these types of consolidated statements, pick one out and have that be the firm approved um, software to do that. And that way you'll have some control over it and you'll be bit, uh, better able to supervise it. Um, and the other thing that I, that I observed when I was at FINRA um, in connection with these, these two firms that were being investigated is they, they apparently had taken the position that all they needed to do to supervise was to review the template and approve the template that would then be used by their registered reps. Um, I can tell you that FINRA does not share that view. Um, FINRA views these types of consolidated statements as communications with customers and believes that they need to be supervised beyond simply reviewing and approving the template. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to review every single one of them, but I think um, you at, at a minimum have to have some type of risk-based approach where you're reviewing at least some of them. Um, and you can document and evidence that to FINRA um, to the extent they ask about it. So. Um, this issue of consolidated statements is one that, that may not have jumped out at you. I think it's going to be an issue that's going to be out there. And, and from what I understand, there are many firms out there that don't really have their arms around it. Um, so I would, I would commend to all of you to, to, to take a look at Reg Notice 1019 and, 
and to try and figure out what exactly is happening at your firm with your reps. Um, the next issue I just wanted to touch on is, is senior investors um, in the sales practice area. Um, senior investors is not a new topic. In fact, it's something that uh, has been a priori priority for FINRA for several years. Um, it is probably the primary focus of Susan Axelrod, who is the head of regulatory operations for all of FINRA. Um, so that topic isn't particularly new. Um, what I thought was interesting about the section on senior investors in this year's priorities letter was the focus on microcap trading, penny stock trading. Um, that's not something I had seen before. Um, FINRA notes in the letter that they've seen an uptick in um, the, the penny stock fraudsters, those people that engage in pump and dump schemes targeting senior investors, which I suppose isn't really a surprise. Um, and so um, I, I thought it was interesting because those two issues, senior investors and penny stock trading, are, are certainly two of the two or three most prioritized issues at FINRA, and, and, and now they're sort of coming together um, in this exam priorities letter. Um, the other thing I thought was noteworthy there was that FINRA had a, a few suggested controls that they thought firms could uh, engage in to better protect senior investors in this microcap trading space. Um, I don't know how, how particularly realistic some of those controls are that they've suggested, but clearly what FINRA is signaling is um, you ought to be looking out for senior investors generally, um, and whatever procedures and processes and surveillance you have in place generally that covers microcap trading, uh, you may need to do a little bit more to the extent that it, it touches on senior investors. So, for example, you, uh, to the extent that your firm identifies accounts as senior investor accounts, uh, it may make sense to, to see if you can create some type of exception report um, that identifies when orders or trades for penny stocks are placed in those accounts and then engage in some type of heightened uh, supervision and follow-up to, to make sure that, that those transactions are really appropriate for your senior investor customers. Um, the next section I wanted to touch on is the suitability section. Again, that's not a new section. It's, I think it's in every FINRA exam priorities letter. Um, so it's a lot of the same things uh, in terms of high level, what, what FINRA is, is looking at and, and prioritizing. Um, what's really different is um, just the, the, the specific products that, that FINRA has identified. Um, so, for example, in the 2016 letter, they, they referenced high-yield speculative bonds, alternative uh, mutual funds, uh, something called securities-backed letters of credit. Um, in this year's priorities letter, those, those particular products, although I, I don't think you should stop worrying about them, um, they've been replaced by a few other ones, non-traded REITs, um, unlisted business development companies. Um, so I think what I would recommend is, you know, take a look at this year's letter, um, see what those products are that FINRA seems to be focused on, um, and, and make a determination as to whether those are products that your firm is selling. And if so, um, you know, survey your, your policies and procedures surrounding those products, your training surrounding those products, your customer disclosures surrounding those products, because those are the kind of things that FINRA is going to ask about when they come to do your exam and, and they start looking at, at uh, you know, more structured type products. Um, the other thing I wanted to note here was just I think there's going to be a continuing uh, focus in the enforcement area on, on products that, in, that, that involve you know, different classes or different structures of fees and expenses. Um, you know, looking back over the last couple of years, um, you know, I think you could say that 2015 was essentially the year of the mutual fund fee waiver cases. Um, there were a number of those cases that were, that were brought um, that involved um, mutual funds that provided for load waived A shares if you were a particular type of retirement account or a charitable account. Um, 
those cases are not done. I know that there are still more in the pipeline. If that's an issue that, um, that your firm has not yet looked at, I would commend you to do that. Um, the window for getting a no-fine settlement, which is what the, the first several um, tranches of cases were, um, there were no fines associated with those cases, that window unfortunately has closed. Um, but I, I still think it would be to your benefit if you haven't looked at that issue to, to get out in front of it um, and see if you can fix it. Um, 2016 um, was the beginning of the variable annuity L-share cases. Um, there were a few of them issued um, just this past fall. I think there will be many more to come in 2017. Um, and as I referenced earlier in my, in my uh, discussion, um, the, uh, the 529 uh, plan share class cases, I think are, there's going to be several of those that, that you're going to see in 2017. Um, I'm being told that I'm, I'm going a little bit long here, so I'm going to go through the next slide very quickly. Um, and that is a, a new section that appeared for the first time, at least in the last couple of years, involving short-term trading of long-term products. Um, as many of you probably know, there was a UIT rollover sweep that began in September of 2016. I think the FINRA is signaling here um, that that's going to expand beyond the targeted firms from, from last fall. Um, so that might be something you should look at. Um, the other thing that you should really focus on in looking at your procedures is um, your switching surveillance. And, um, you know, everyone has some type of switching surveillance systems out there. But you need to make sure that your, your systems can catch uh, scenarios where a rep switches a customer from a mutual fund to a UIT and then back to a mutual fund, you know, later on. Um, not all surveillance systems can account for that type of activity. The other thing that, um, that I saw when I was at FINRA that was a concern um, was a situation where registered reps switch a customer out of a product, for example, a variable annuity, um, leave those funds in cash for a period of time long enough to, uh, to avoid the firm surveillance and then put them back into a, a different variable annuity, you know, 60 or 90 days later so it won't be captured on, a, on an exception report. Um, take a look at those issues and, um, and hopefully you're, uh, if you need to update your, your procedures and your surveillance. Um, so I have talked probably too much, um, so I am now going to turn things over to Allison, who's going to talk with you about uh, priorities in the financial and operation area. Take it away, Allison. Thanks, Dean. Uh, as Dean mentioned, my name is Allison Charney, and I'm a partner in the New York office. I'm going to touch on the financial and operational risks that FINRA mentioned in their 2017 priorities letter. Um, so the first thing I want to highlight are liquidity issues. Um, this was a major topic in 2016 for FINRA. It was one of their three broad issues, along with conflicts of interest and supervision. And we anticipate, based on the 2016 assessments, that FINRA has a pretty clear picture of what they are you know, perceiving as deficiencies in liquidity management, and they're going to focus on these shortcomings in 2017. Um, in the letter, FINRA urges firms to consider Reg uh, Notice 15-33, which um, we will be providing you with hyperlinks to some of these materials that we've mentioned at the end of the program. Um, but specifically, they've, they've prioritized a number of issues that I just wanted to mention to you. Um, they're going to be looking at your policies and practices regarding stress tests, both market-wide stresses and stresses to specific um, certain products. And um, they're going to also look at your funding contingency plans. Um, they, what I found interesting in the letter, what we saw this time, was that they're going to look at your, also your funding sources. Um, and one point that we hadn't seen before is they're going to look at, um, they found issue with funding contingencies that relied on secured and unsecured loan facilities. So if your liquidity plans do rely on those products, just be prepared that FINRA is going to be taking a close look at that. Um, Binner also mentioned uh, something new, that they're going to look at how clearing firms incorporate funding needs of large introducing firms into their contingency plans. And this is especially where the large introducing firms are relying on clearing brokers for funding during a stress event. So again, that's also something to keep in mind in 2017. 
an interesting point that we saw missing from the 2017 priorities letter, but was a uh, focus in the 2016, were concerns about liquidity at high frequency trading firms. I thought this omission was just an interesting one since as of this year, as of January 30th, high frequency traders have to pass their Series 57 exams and register as a securities trader. So even though it's missing from the, the 2017 priorities letter, I think it's just something to keep on your radar and see what unfolds um, regarding those issues. Another financial risk topic that we saw in the letter um, that Finner seems that FINRA will address in 2017 involves how firms manage risk across the organization. FINRA says in their letter that for the past two years they've been talking with larger firms to understand how risk is managed. Um, what they seem to be doing now is they're going to formalize these discussions. They're going to ask a select group uh, to explain how they would react to a certain test case scenario. We don't know what the test case will look like or even who's going to be asked to participate at this point. Um, and, but FINRA does say that they're going to use this information to understand certain firms' risk management practices, and they're going to look at it, you know, whether it's reasonable in light of, of, the biz, of their business line. Um, they do make a point to say that there's no, you know, right way or wrong way to handle this test case scenario, but we do recommend, you know, if you are getting these phone calls to talk with counsel, your compliance folks, make sure everybody is on the same page before you engage in this, uh, this stress scenario. Um, another uh, financial risk that was highlighted in the letter uh, is regarding amendments to Rule 4210. As many of you know, 4210 um, is described in great, real technical detail, um, certain margin requirements. And essentially, these amendments um, are going to, these amendments are um, focusing on um, marg minimum amounts of margin um, with counterparties, especially re with respect to what are called covered agency transactions. Um, there's lots of detail as to what a covered agency transaction is, but essentially it's um, for transactions like uh, mortgage-backed securities and other pooled instruments where a significant portion of the activity is on margins. And so that's you know, creating a potential risk situation um, with counterparty exposure. So the uh, implementation of these amendments has been phased. Phase one just passed in December 2016, um, and the actual margin requirements will become effective in, at the end of this year in, in December. So with regard to these amendments from an enforcement and exam perspective, um, FINRA is going to look at how you are, are starting to implement the amendments to 4210. They're going to look at your, how you have set up credit risk policies and risk limit determinations with, your, with counterparties. From a practical standpoint, um, depending, and depending on you know, what business lines you're in, certain margin agreements are going to be, need to be renegotiated and certain arrangements are going to, you're going to have to set up some new, entirely new arrangements. So again, that's another thing to keep in mind uh, as we head well into 2017. All right, next slide. So FINRA also highlighted a number of operational risks, um, and I have chosen a few that I wanted to highlight to talk with you about. Um, the first is cybersecurity. There's no surprise there. We see cybersecurity mentioned year after year, and you've probably all been to conferences or CLEs on this topic. Maybe you've and panelists, and some of you are experts. Um, and it's really, it's hard to predict the future, what will happen in cybersecurity, because you are, in a sense, relying on outside bad actors, and I guess sometimes from the inside to um, create, you know, some kind of havoc on your institution. But FINRA is going to really be looking to you to make sure that you have as many uh, protections in place. So if such an event does happen, you're prepared. Um, just taking some guidance from the SEC, the SEC did seem to dip their toe a bit um, into the cyber issues this year, and it looks like FINRA may be following suit. Um, like FINRA, the SEC may, has made cyber a 2017 priority. Um, they're also going to, the SEC has said that it's going to be focusing on using Reg SP, 
which is the framework for safeguarding customer information, as a tool for bringing cyber um, security actions against firms. They already did it in late 2015. Um, there was a settlement with uh, an investment advisor where uh, the SEC alleged that they'd failed to establish cyber cybersecurity policies. Um, and the, the head of um, enforcement mentioned in mid-2016 that they're going to continue to use this reg um, to bring enforcement in action. Um, there's also another enforcement action in mid-2016 um, with a settlement with Morgan Stanley where the SEC said it perceived certain deficiencies in how they protected customer information, and the SEC claimed that some of that information had been hacked and uh, offered for sale online. So that's what the SEC was doing in 2016. FINRA really wasn't um, as active in, in the cyber world, but um, it seems like there is this, this industry, the securities industry is ripe for some major actions, and, and we'll see um, what FINRA is going to do. They did highlight three areas. Um, that they're going to focus on. I, I don't know if cyber uh, technical professionals will agree that these are the, the sort of hot topics, but this is at least what FINRA is going to focus on. Um, one is, is your branch offices. FINRA has observed poor controls in branch offices, um, especially related to the using or lack of using passwords and encrypting data. And so firms need to ask themselves whether the branch offices are really as good on cybersecurity as the home office. And again, that's assuming your home offices are good on cybersecurity. Another area that they're focusing on is called WORM, which I actually think, in my opinion, is a terrible name when you're dealing with cyber issues. But what it stands for is write once, read many, and it's a, it's a data uh, storage specification. So basically, once the information is written, it can't be modified. Um, SEC Rule 17A-4 is uh, the regulatory framework that requires firms to store customer data in worm format. And FINRA did bring an action um, against 12, did find 12 firms in late uh, 2016. Um, for failing what they perceived as deficiencies in preserving their cu customer records in WORM format. So I think there's no question that WORM is going to keep, keep coming up, and you're going to be asked about um, how documents are being preserved in that format, and that's something to uh, discuss with your IT departments. And the third topic uh, I wanted to highlight with regard to cyber is uh, vendors. Vendor is going to be concerned about how you send your, your information outside the firm. Um, and so that, similar to how they're, uh, similar to concerns with the branch offices, um, that will be something that will come up, um, I think, in 2017. All right. The next topic um, is, uh, the cons is consum our consumer protection issues. Um, FINRA has made it a priority to that firms comply with Rule 15C3-3. And some of you are probably asking, what is Rule 15C3-3, which is a good question. It is the, um, the SEC's customer protection rule. Um, I mean, the basic idea is that it's, it's a way to limit the risky use of client funds and essentially assure, ensure if a firm becomes insolvent, God forbid, um, customers will still be able to get the bulk of their investments. There are extremely complicated formulas that govern how much cash needs to be on hand. Um, but there's a, the simple concept is if you owe more to a customer than the customer owes you, you must set aside a certain amount of cash. Um, and, for secure, and on the security side, um, the securities must be held, you know, free of liens. To preserve the cash and the securities, they are locked up in, base, in what is called a special uh, reserve bank account. And what FINRA is going to look at is how these bank accounts are, are managed and handled. Um, what we saw in 2016 on the SEC side was the SEC announced the Consumer Protection Rule Initiative, the CPR initiative, where it's going, it was going to recommend favorable settlements if firms self-reported violations of 15C3-3. Um, the, the cutoff for reporting was at the end of 2016, and we'll see what unfolds from that. Um, so while FINRA hasn't announced that it's doing its own CPR initiative, it seems like it may be some, doing some version of that. Um, the 2017 letter indicates that FINRA is 
well, it seems like they're interested in all aspects of these special reserve um, bank accounts. But I just wanted to highlight a few things that they're looking at um, with regard to uh, what they may what may show up on exams. Um, they're going to look at your the reserve formulas and whether they include all customer positions on all platforms. Um, they're going to look at how cash is being transferred in and out of these bank accounts and whether it's fast enough and whether you're creating any uh, shortfalls due to, to due to delay, delays. Um, they, we're going to look at the agreements um, governing these bank accounts and make sure that they have the no lien language so uh, securities would be free of liens. And um, Finner also mentioned that they're concerned that some firms are engaging in transactions with basically little or no economic benefit only to avoid obligations or reduce obligations under this rule. So that's obviously not a good thing, and FINRA is going to review this behavior very closely, so I would expect um, some strict, some scrutiny on that in that area. Um, and finally, just to hit home, this is probably that this is a, a serious concern this year. There were two significant SEC enforcement actions um, for violations of this rule. The first was in um, June 2016. Um, that's when uh, the SEC announced that Merrill had agreed to pay about $415 million to settle charges of, of this violation. And then at the end of December, there was another announcement, um, a $1 million settlement with Morgan Stanley. What I wanted to, uh, we don't have time to go into details of these cases, but what I did want to point out, which was interesting in the Morgan Stanley case, is that the SEC noted in its release, in its press release and in the order, that Morgan Stanley had provided substantial cooperation during the investigation, and that was a factor for the penalty being much lower. And so I think a key takeaway here is that cooperation and self-reporting is going to be a real keys to success if you are being, if your firms are being investigated um, for any consumer or customer pr uh, protection violations. And. Finally, the uh, last operational risk that I'm going to talk about is reg show. Um, it gets its own slide, but that's basically just because of spacing issues. Um, but it did feature prominently in the letter. Um, and for those of you who are new to reg show or just need a refresher, it's, essentially, it's the regulatory framework for short sales. Um, and again, this is another topic that we could spend hours on, but um, in, in summing it up in a few seconds, um, there are essentially two main issues when dealing with short sales with that, that broker-dealers are, are have to focus on. One is locating the security, and then the other is closing out the open short position. And as you may have guessed, I'm bringing those two up because that's what FINRA sees is going to be um, a priority for them. Regarding the locate issue, this is governed by uh, Rule 203 of Reg Show. And it, it basically, in a perfect world, the broker-dealer locates the security, you document that locate, and then that prior to affecting uh, a short sale transaction. Um, that, takes, that can take time and research. And so to avoid having to research this availability, um, firms have created, and they're completely legal, um, easy-to-borrow lists which are updated every 24 hours. Um, so if a security is on the ETB list, you can transact in a short sale. But what FINRA is going to look at is they're going to focus on these ETB lists, on the locate process, um, how your ETB lists are prepared, and then also utilized by your, you and your clients. And then with regard to closeout issues, that's governed by Rule 204 of, of Reg Show. Um, those, again, have very complicated um, provisions, but the basic idea is that uh, typically the short position must uh, close out within T3, which is three days from the trade date. And if you don't meet various exemptions or you miss out this closeout date, um, you have to close out this failure to deliver position by T4, which is four days from the, from the trade date, sometimes in certain situations six. Um, and so FINRA has observed um, failures to deliver on the settlement date. Um, they're recommending that firms monitor, that you look, take a close look at your closeout processes to make sure that you're com in compliance with Reg Show. That's something that's going to be scrutinized and that, um, I, that will definitely come up in 2017. So I hope I got us on track and um, that this was a helpful summary of the financial and operational risks. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to Joe, who's going to do a review of the market integrity priorities. 
Well, th thanks, Allison, and good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Joe Edmondson um, from the DC office. Um, market integrity is, 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 has been for a number of years a, a prominent section, uh, albeit the last section of the FINRA priorities letter. Um, there, this, there's a lot of repeats here for year to year. Um, there's, there's not a lot on here that, that we haven't heard a lot about before. Um, FINRA just seems to be sharpening their focus on, on some particular areas, and I want to try to bring those out a little bit. Um, tell you two things that are that, that were missing um, uh, from this year's letter that were in, in 2016. Um, the lead item in the 2016 le letter was the vendor display rule, um, and that's not mentioned at all this year. Um, so perhaps FINRA is uh, happy with with the results of mentioning that. Um, there's also not much um, discussion really of high frequency or al algorithmic trading. Um, I'll, I'll get to one one very brief mention of it. Um, it's kind of hidden in another section, but uh, but for the most part, uh, we're, they're not talking much in this letter about about that kind of trading, which is which is kind of interesting because it was it was such a a loud issue, if you will, for. Um, for a number uh, of letters, um, yeah, let me mention one other thing before I get started, and that is, you know, the, the, I thought it might be interesting to, to point out the way that FINRA sometimes uses this uh, examination priority letter in its enforcement um, program. So I asked Dean a little bit about this as we were preparing for this, and I was curious myself, and I, I, I looked around to see if I could find some cases where. Uh, in enforcement settlements where where the the priorities letters were cited and and lo and behold um, uh, I found one um, the electronic uh, transaction clearing Inc settlement of February 2016 cites every exam priority letter from 2009 to 2011 when the uh, which is when the conduct occurred uh, in the case, uh, it's a million dollar fine, and but the the AWC goes. Um, actually, it was not AWC; it was an offer, accepted offer of settlement um, document. But it goes in, in, into great lengths to describe how the respondent's conduct was uh, mentioned over and over and over in prior letters. Um, so I thought I thought that was significant, and that's you know really what FINRA is trying to do with with these letters every year is to put the industry on notice uh, as to what they feel their priorities are, and the rubber really met the road uh, in that case. So um, leading off the marketing te integrity section of the letter is uh, some general comments about anti, anti manipulation. Um, the big takeaway I think that I want to convey here is that. Is that FINRA has, is providing firms with with a number of report cards or tools that uh, that can be used as part of the surveillance program and otherwise to to ensure compliance with uh, with FINRA obligations. You know, there's six or eight trading report cards that that are already out there on things like OATS compliance and trade throughs and things like that. Um, but FINRA has come out with a new one, this cross market equity. Um, uh, report and and the, the the origin of that was that this was a big item in the 2015 letter, um, and then they spent some time developing this report card. It came out in 2016, uh, released to the industry, and now they're telling you that they really expect you to use it. Um, so if you're if you're if you're doing any kind of uh, uh, equity trading across markets, um, firms should be using this report card. Um, but they want to make it clear, and they do make it clear in this letter, that the use of the report card is not a replacement for whatever the firm uh, feels they need to do on their own. So uh, the report card should be part of, but not a replacement for, a well-designed internal surveillance program. Um, another thing that FINRA really points out in, is every year in the market integrity uh, section, and particularly this year, is – the obligations of firms to to do their part um, by making sure the, the all the reporting obligations uh, are, are uh, followed closely. Uh, OATS obviously is is one that, that that's easy to single out. Um, this year, uh, FINRA is adding to uh, the OATS rules. They've amended them to include more information regarding ATSs. Um, 
and the identification of non FINRA members that participate in the OTC market. Um, so, you know, when FINRA does this, when they add data compilation and reporting elements, they're not doing it in a vacuum. They're doing it because they've got some element of surveillance that they are trying to program from their end that they need more data for. So, um, so when they add something like that, there, there there's two enforcement um, uh, angles that that you need to worry about. One is that you need to make sure you're 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 reporting the way you should be, because that in and of itself is a is it can be a significant enforceable rule violation. Um, but but also the data that you're providing, ironically, is going to lead to the possible um, identification through their FINRA surveillance of other activities such as manipulation that could come back at you that way. So the more you know, data in, data out uh, kind of a thing. Um, best execution is a is a topic that that, that we see every year. Um, you know, what's interesting about that this year uh, is that. Uh, uh, in 2015, they issued this regulatory notice 1546, which is a you know very broad, nice piece of guidance. Um, in 2016, they didn't talk about best execution in the letter basically at all. Uh, they mentioned it a couple times for fixed income, but they didn't talk about it broadly. Um, apparently, uh, the, the the firms didn't totally get the message about best execution because it's back. Uh, and uh, I took a look at the best execution cases, and 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 what's interesting there is that the the uh, uh, the 2015 uh, uh, notice came out. It was it was mentioned in the. Uh, uh, in the 2015 letter that it was coming out, and then early 2016, um, Merrill Lynch ended up settling for uh, a fairly significant fine in a fixed income best execution case. So, as Dean said, the things that you see mentioned in these letters, sometimes there's like maybe a case in progress, a series of cases in progress that they're that they are uh, hinting that that those cases are coming. Um, Time is growing short, but let me let me point out a few other things here. Um, as is typical for the market integrity section of the letter, there's a lot of announcements. There's a lot of uh, uh, FINRA reporting things that they're doing. Um, so they 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 announced this year their audit trail reporting early remediation initiative. Uh, I won't go into much much detail on that, but the 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 pilot trading examination program is actually kind of interesting. So. So for for years, uh, it appears that smaller firms have not been uh, uh, examined if their trading volume doesn't hit certain levels that make it worth FINRA's time and effort to go do those examinations. Uh, FINRA has recognized that, and they are you know putting smaller firms on notice that you, that you might actually get examined this year where you may not have in in many years um, because of this pilot program. So. Uh, you know that's a uh, certainly could be a, a, a an interesting uh, development if you get a, a, an exam letter for the first time if you hadn't been examined previously. Um, few issues special to um, to ATSs as I mentioned. Um, the OATS rules have been amended and there's going to be more uh, uh, requirements to report uh, ATS data uh, through OATS. Um, Centers noted that they're also going to be looking at the disclosures that ATSs make uh, uh, to their customers. Um, and lastly, uh, I want to talk about fixed income issues um, because it, it seems like that is, is a growing concern um, if you look at, 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 at prior letters uh, with issues in the fixed income market. There's a lot as, as the market is, as the technology is getting better, the, the fixed income market, which you know decades ago was very dark and not very transparent, has become more brighter and more transparent. We know more about what, about the trading that's going on and in, in, in real time, oftentimes, uh, which means that it's easier to surveil, both for FINRA to surveil and for firms to to do their own surveil surveillance. So FINRA is reminding firms to. Um, to, to, to look for manipulation in fixed income securities. Uh, and there was a case that came out 
um, you see the non bona fide uh, trading uh, bullet there on my slide. Uh, that is a direct reference to the Fala case, to the Alejandro Fala case that came out at the very end of last year, December 5th, 2016. Uh, very, very interesting case um, on its facts. Um, you know, doesn't doesn't really involve a large firm, but the um, there was a secret prearranged trading arrangement that allowed um, the the municipal broker to uh, hide the fact that he was getting uh, additional compensation, additional markups, where he had um, promised the customer that the markups would be limited to 15 basis points on each trade. Um, so it's the secret prearranged trading with, uh, away from the, the, the direct customer that allowed this to occur that was, that was very problematic. Um, Interesting case. A lot of facts are, are uh, how this was done is talked about in detail in the case. It's worth worth reading. Um, municipal advisor registration is 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 new as of late last year in, in September. Um, you know, it's a requirement of Dodd Frank. Um, Venero points out that uh, you know that, that it has noticed quote <laughs> quote noticed that uh, that various municipal uh, participants municipal market participants have not been registering and that includes firms and now with the requirement that municipal advisor reps are to be registered it's going to include individuals as well so when you're looking at your uh, uh, at your business, um, if it crosses over, um, think of this as the new Series 7 uh, for municipal advisors. If you look at the exam, it's 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 a soup to nuts kind of general examination regarding the municipal market. Um, as I said, the more transparency in the municipal, I mean, in the fixed income area includes uh, uh, more transparency that's coming for treasuries. With that transparency comes the ability to do more uh, c customer protection, more transparency, more uh, surveillance, um, particularly with respect to uh, uh, abusive algorithms or violations of other treasury rules. Um, and that, that's the, what I mentioned before, that's the one place where abusive algorithms is mentioned in the entire letter is in connection with uh, treasury trading. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kayla, who has a special announcement. At this time, I'm going to read the CLE code for this program. If you are in need of CLE credit today, please enter this five-digit code into the poll question on the screen after it is announced and press the Submit button. The code is as follows, P-N-E-O-R. Again, that's P as in pig, N as in nose, E as in elephant, O as in orange, R as in red. I'll give you a few seconds there to type that in. One more time. That's P as in pig, N as in nose, E as in elephant, O as in orange, R as in red. Again, if you are seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the polling question by entering the code that I just announced. The polling question will remain open briefly. For those seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and return it immediately following the program. A copy of the form can be found in the resource list widget. At this time, the poll is now closed. I would like to return the program to Joe. Whoops, double advance that. All right, so bringing this all together, um, time to prepare. Again, the purpose of the, of the exam letter is to help firms. Um, it is a, is a bit of a gift. Uh, some might even call it teaching to the test. Um, and here's how here's how I do it. Others might have different ways to do this, and I'm not trying to be all uh, Six Sigma in terms of procedures and flow charts here with this. But 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 the way that I help firms figure out how to use this letter is that we, the first place we start is by by looking at the firm's business. So you know, in a large in a large uh, firm, 
there, there may be you know many different business lines in a smaller firm, maybe maybe only one. Um, but but understand what the firm's doing and 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 get all of that out um, onto the table. Then identify the overlap with the FINRA priorities. Um, and, and, and see whether there's, there's lines of business that are touched in some way by some of the priorities that are identified in the, in the, in the letter. Then go to the firm's um, written supervisory procedures, because the written supervisory procedures really should cover every aspect of the firm's uh, business. And if they don't, we're going to find that out through this process, actually, as, an, as a value add. Um, you look at each FINRA priority, you go to the procedure, see what the procedure says, and then you do an exercise to assess the adequacy of that procedure based on what we know about FINRA's priorities. That assessment process looks at the procedure and then looks at the documentation that the firm has amassed regarding its, its um, efforts to fulfill that procedure, whether it be a, a, a trade review, an exception report, um, you know, anything that's there, you know, evidence of registration of, uh, of, of new hires, whatever it is, uh, you look at that documentation and you determine the, the adequacy. Um, it's either it's a binary question, it's either adequate or it's not adequate. If it's adequate, you move on. If it's not adequate, you rectify the omissions and, and update if necessary. And by update, I mean update the procedure because you may, in the process of looking at the procedure, um, you may find that it's it's slightly out of date. It doesn't take into account all of the requirements of the regulatory notice or or a rule change or what what uh, or whatever that may be. So you so you put that all together. Now now little la, little last caveat is that by, by doing this you 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 foresee and you solve a lot of problems proactively, but you, firms are still a little bit exposed, and, and I, I want to point out a case that came out last year, OTR Global Trading in May of 2016. It's only a $10,000 settled fine, and it has to do with, with, with compliance under the market access rule. I can't tell everything I need to know about this case from the, from the facts uh, that are cited in the AWC, but what it looks like is it looks like the firm was doing its market access rule compliance process correctly, but it was not documenting it correctly with the annual certifications. And when it discovered that it was not documenting it properly, it went ahead and did the annual certifications. It didn't backdate them. It didn't try to commit fraud and backdate them to the, make it appear that they were certified during the right time period. They, they, they executed them in the current time period referring back to the prior time period. Then refine them for that because it's the, the requirement that you certify annually your compliance with the market access rules and annual um, requirements similar to other FINRA annual requirements. So they, they did it right by doing the underlying procedure right and, and they caught the documentation perhaps even in preparation for an exam um, uh, and, the, and, they, and they went ahead and remedied it. They rectified their omission. They still got fined. So it's not a uh, it's not a get out of jail free card, but it's it's better to go through the process than to not go through the process. So Dean, you want to moderate our questions? Um, I do. Thanks, Joe. Um, and I'm going to go quickly because I know we're a little bit over the time. So if you can all bear with us, we're going to go through um, some questions that we've gotten very quickly. Um, the first question was, how does Finra define senior investors? Um, Back three or four years ago, when they they put out their joint report with the uh, with NASA and the SEC um, discussing the senior investor issue, um, I, I wouldn't even really call it a definition, but but the way they viewed senior investors was, was much more focused on life stage as opposed to any particular age. So it was really focused on folks that were retired or near retirement. Um, that's sort of the the standard that Finra used or that was used in that report. Uh, more recently, FINRA has proposed a rule um, that um, would allow firms to contact a trusted advisor uh, in the event that they believe that a, a, an, a senior investor um, is being exploited or taken advantage of by someone. In that proposed rule, they define senior investor as someone 65 or older or somebody that has some type of impairment that that renders them 
um, unable to, to protect their own interests. So there's a little bit more specificity there. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. If not, please feel free to follow up. Uh, next question was, um, notwithstanding the absence of culture uh, in, in this year's letter, um, do we have any sense of whether FINRA will be publishing guidance based on what FINRA learned through its culture sweep last year, and um, will firm culture be a part of cycle exams in 2007? Um, with respect to the first question, the first part of the question, um, I, I don't have any direct knowledge about FINRA publishing guidance, um, but it would be shocking to me if they didn't, if they went through all that effort and, and, and all that hand-wringing that they put firms through um, to, um, to ask them about culture and to produce documents and meet with them and discuss with them issues surrounding firm culture. It would be shocking if they didn't put out some type of um, guidance or best practices type document. So I think there will be something. Um, whether, with, with respect to whether firm culture will be part of cycle exams in 2017, um, I actually don't think so. I, I think they, 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 they hit a series of firms, mostly the, the larger firms that they wanted to, uh, to learn about that issue um, with. I don't think it's a coincidence that firm culture was not referenced again in uh, the 2017 priorities letter. So um, I could be wrong, but I, I don't think it's going to be something <clears throat> that the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the sort of baseline exam staff is going to focus on in their cycle exams. Um, Dean, can I just add, this is Joe, that I would be shocked if Robert Cook didn't, didn't use a major part of his keynote speech at, the, at CIFMA next month to, to address the culture issue. Right, exactly. And so, so we, we may learn more about that um, um, at CIFMA in, a, in another month. Um, Allison, do you want to you want to take the next one? Sure. So um, this is a question: Do you think recent the recent proposal by the CFTC will prompt FINRA or the SEC to look at amending record keeping obligations to permit record keepers to leverage advances in information technology such as cloud versus worm? Um, I think that they – well, I know that they all uh, have cyber security representatives, that they do uh, – a lot of the federal agencies, they get together and, and meet um, at least quarterly. I actually know the, the, the uh, CFTC um, representative. Um, and what I, what I think is happening is that they're all looking at what everyone is doing, and they will take guidance from each other, but there is also the unspoken competition as to who can get it right uh, first. So I – do you think they're all looking at what each agency is doing? And I don't um, know for certain whether FINRA or, SC, or the SEC will will copy what the CFTC is doing, but I know that they're definitely taking it into consideration. Just to add to that, this is Dean again. Um, I, I, Allison's 100% right. They will be looking at what other agencies are doing, um, but having worked at FINRA, it, to the extent that they're inclined to make changes, it'll take a very long time to do it. Um, and then I think our last question may be one for Kayla, actually. It's um, – oh, she's already answered it. Um, okay. So that is it for the uh, the question and answers. Kayla, do you have something you need to, to read at the end, or can we just – Yeah, I mean, that kind of wraps it up for today. Just a reminder, the presentation will be available on Foley.com the next few days along with recording. Um, and then at the end here, there will be a questionnaire – We'd appreciate um, if you could take a minute or two to give us your feedback. It's important for us to know your thoughts and helps us to shape our programs going forward. Um, if you have any questions, again, please contact one of the attorneys here, Oli or me, Kayla Hooven. Um, I'm happy to help answer any questions. And thanks for your participation. And that's about all we have for today. Thanks, everyone.